this is Robert Glassy. You're listening to TV Confidential. Ed Robertson welcoming you to TV Confidential. Radio talk show about television. Stacy Keach will join us in our second hour. Stacy Keach, star of Titus, Lights Out, Man with a Plan, and Mickey Spillane's Mike Camber. Stacy's about to star as the creature in an original adaptation of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, produced by LA Theater Works, that will soon be broadcast on radio stations across the country and around the world. We'll tell you more about that when Stacy Keach joins us in our second. Hour. We'll be able to join us for that. In the meantime, we will begin this hour by welcoming Mr. Steve Stolyer. Steve has been a professional writer for print and for television for more than 30 years, providing material for Dick Cavett, as well as writing episodes of such shows as Murder, She Wrote and Simon and Simon. Steve Stolyer is also an accomplished voice artist. His credits include such animated specials as Frosty Returns, You're in the Super Bowl, Charlie Brown, and Snoopy's reunion, plus he has written and produced documentaries on such diverse personages as John Lennon, the Marx Brothers, Elvis Presley, Shemp Howard, and Dr. Martin Luther King. Steve Stoyer began his career in the entertainment industry accidentally, kind of, sort of, in the early 1970s when a series of events led to a job as the personal secretary and archivist for the one, the only, Groucho Marx during the last three years of Groucho's life, a period during which time Steve Stoyer grew from being a starry-eyed fan to ultimately Groucho's protector during a drawn-out and tumultuous battle over control of the comedian's estate. All that is chronicled in Steve's book, Raised Eyebrows, which, if you have not read it yet already, will tell you where to find it in just a second. But first, we began our conversation by telling Steve, I took a quick visit to your website uh, before I called you. Now, is the book still optioned and maybe going to be a movie made out of it? Yes, they're still aiming to have that happen by the end of the year. The thing that changed is that uh, that Rob Zombie isn't attached as director anymore, but yeah. the producers are still looking to get it made. Well, I doubt I'm the first person to tell you this, but uh, I know what it, you're going to say. And no, I mean, and I and I mean it because I mean it. It's a great story. Thank you. It's a great story, and leave it to Cavett to really, you know, synthesize it in his introduction. But you really do grow as the hero throughout the course of page one to page. Whatever. And that's just, I mean, not, not only is it a great read, but it really is a cinematic story. Well, it did occur to me, even while I was writing it, that it had certain echoes of my favorite year mm -hmm. and Sunset Boulevard and Ed Wood and different things where there's an, an impressionable young person dropped into this atmosphere with, with a venerable older hero and... Uh, that Aaron Fleming is sort of the antagonist, <laughs> and I had to do a lot of growing up at a very young age uh, dealing with these larger-than-life personalities. But yes, I start out as this wide-eyed kid, you know, opening the door into Oz and everything shifting to Technicolor, and then gradually realizing uh, that things weren't exactly as they had appeared to me. But also, as with the Oz analogy, most of it was wonderful. Mm -hmm. uh, there were dark woods and uh, witches and so forth, but it was a literal dream come true since I used to dream about meeting Groucho, and it would be so vivid and tangible, and then I would wake up and think, damn it, it was, I, could, I could touch his hand and the cigar... And it was all in my mind, I'm never going to meet him. And I'm happy to have been proven wrong about that. And not only did you meet him, you, you got to know him as close as anybody else did during the last three years of his life, Steve. And there are many moments, especially in the second half of Raising Eyebrows, which is the name of Steve's book, Oh, Raised Eyebrows. I'm sorry, Raised Eyebrows. Raised Eyebrows, which is the name of Steve's book, folks. There are many moments for me as a reader where 
in, in, in a way, there's a little bit of sadness because, you know... Well, I'm getting close to my hero as he's fading out. I'm yeah. dealing with the fact that he's had strokes that have, you know, diminished his powers to a degree, and also dealing with the volatility of Aaron Fleming, who was in charge of his life in those last years. So there is some darkness and sadness. A lot of people who've had to deal with elderly relatives, either with uh, dementia or strokes or something, have said it reminded them of what it was like dealing with their grandfather or their father, that sort of thing. And it, and it was a, just an enormous growing experience for me to be dealing with these life and death situations in and around all of the funny and warm and rewarding stuff and meeting the people in his circle, uh, people who worked on his films and people like Mae West and Steve Allen and Jack Lemmon and Bob Hope and uh, S.J. Perelman. I mean, it was just a remarkable experience, and I never tired of it. And yes, I was right inside his house. I initially figured when I got the job I'd be working in some... Wilshire Boulevard office building and maybe Groucho would come in once or twice a month to sign checks or pick something up and it was like no no you'll be working right in his house you'll have your own room as your office you could make your own hours and it's like and they're paying me for this I get paid money to just immerse myself in my hero and and all of his memorabilia that needed to be collated and organized for its eventual donation to the Smithsonian. And because it was an egalitarian household, uh, I got to sit at the lunch table regardless of who was coming over or if there was no one there and it was just Groucho and me or Groucho and Nurse and me. Uh, it wasn't as if the help had to eat in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. So I was there as a fly on the wall and, and often a participatory fly. Uh, as people would, you know, George Burns came to lunch one day, the doorbell rang, I opened it, and he just said, hi, you want to live an old, you want to live a long time? Become an actor, you'll live to be an old man like Groucho and me. Okay, let's eat. And we were off and running, and it was like watching the Sunshine Boys as they compared notes and conflicting memories of where certain vaudeville houses were and who owned them and all this. Just a panorama Plus the uh, historical aspect of it, because Groucho, in addition to being Groucho Marx, he was someone who personally knew W.C. Fields and George Gershwin and Irving Thalberg and James Thurber, these, you know, mythic people. And also just as a man from 1890, mm -hmm. whose firsthand memories went from before the Wright brothers to after the moon landing, he was just this human time capsule. I asked him once, how far back do you remember? And he said, I guess the Spanish-American War, <laughs> 1898. He was eight years old. Yeah. And, and since he started out as a singer before getting into comedy, he was even on the bill at a special charity performance at the Metropolitan Opera House in New York, and the money went to help victims of the San Francisco earthquake of 1906. So he was just this venerable link to so much history and so much show business history. Steve Stoliar is the author of Raised Eyebrows, My Years Inside Groucho's House, which is available in paperback and as an e-book through our friends at Bear Manor Media. Steve's website, stevestolier.com. Yes, S-T-O-L-I-A-R. If they go to stevestolier.com, if you want to order a signed or personalized copy of the book, uh, you're welcome to do that, and I'll sign it and send it along. Uh, or uh, on Amazon, you can get it in softcover, hardcover, Kindle. And I also did the audio book, which was quite a task. I mean, it just took hours and hours and hours. But I do all the voices along the way, and I've heard from a number of people who said, I have the book, but listening to the audio book was a different experience because it was like entertainment or a performance as I slipped into and out of the different, the different people. So 
there's different ways to acquire it if uh, your listeners are so inclined. And I heartily recommend that uh, you either listen to Steve's audiobook or, or, or pick up a copy or, or download it onto your Kindle. It's a great read. Thank uh, you. It is a great read. Raised Eyebrows by Steve Stolier. I want to make sure I get your pronunciation. And, and, uh, the, I mean, the people who gave me blurbs for the back of the book, Woody Allen and Steve Allen and Jack Lemmon and Dick Cavett, when I did a uh, an updated, expanded version of the book in 2012, catching people up on what had happened since the hardcover came out, uh, Woody Allen told a friend of mine, Stolier's book is still the best, most interesting thing written on Groucho, which was very gratifying to hear because that wasn't a, an official blurb. That was just uh, something he had said to a friend of mine. Yeah. So it was very cool that uh, people think, you know, people seem to enjoy. And, and one, of the, one of my favorite compliments is when people say, I hate you. Because <laughs> I would hate me too. Yeah. If I were of the, I was the biggest Groucho fan in the world. All I wanted to do was shake his hand, but I knew he was in his 80s and in failing health, and I thought, I, there's no way I'm going to get to meet him. He'll be gone. And if I heard about this kid that got to work inside his house every day, I mean, first, initially, it was seven days a week during a, a summer break of college. I would be so envious. I would meet them and say, I hate you for having had that experience. So I enjoy hearing that. I also enjoy it when people say, you owe me eight hours of sleep. (laughs) I sat down with this and I thought, I'm just going to read to chapter six. And damn you, you make me want to see what's in chapter seven. I mean, I've had considerable experience writing for television. And I know about you know, having the body fall out of the closet mm-hmm. right before you go into a commercial, yeah. you have to tune back in to see what happens next. So I tried to write it thinking, also I wrote it in small chapters because I know sometimes I'll be reading something and mm-hmm. I'll think, how many more chapters is this or how many more pages? And I'll flip through and go, oh, I don't want to read 17 more pages. But when it's only four more, you think, okay, I can get to the end of that. And then before you know it, people would say, I, and I finished the book, you know, it just kind of melted uh, in their hands, like not like M and M's. Well, two things: a, you owe me a day because uh, I... <laughs> please choose, please choose wisely. <laughs> but two, you, you you mentioned most of the chapters are very very short vignettes or episodes, you know, right. of of your life uh, in Groucho's house and. In a way, this I, I had this effect, you know, and it, it, it's sort of like uh, to mix metaphors. Reading your book was sort of like binge watching on your life with Groucho, because as as you said, you, you I would, like that. Yeah, and you would you would you okay? I'm only going to read a couple of chapters, but I ended up reading ten chapters at a time, and I couldn't wait to go back to it. And uh, and binge reading. Yes, <laughs> binge reading. <laughs> Oh, that's a nice way of looking at it. That's yeah. true. It's when I catch up with the series, you think, gee, these were these originally aired a week apart, and people had to wait to see what happens next. Now you can just hit pause and go take a leak and come back and watch the next two weeks' worth in two hours. So, yeah, thank you for saying that. But uh, and, and I also, pe- a lot of people have said, I felt like I was with you, witnessing this with you, which was my intention. Yeah. I sort of wanted to take the reader on a journey, because I really, I had no show business background. I was just this kid from St. Louis that grew up in the San Fernando Valley and had a passion for old movies and old comedies and the Marx Brothers, and specifically Groucho. And um, I started a a petition drive when I was at UCLA to put pressure on Universal to clear the rights to animal crackers, which hadn't been seen in many years. And they didn't think there was any point in shelling out good money for an old black and white comedy. But uh, we showed them that there was a solid audience, and Groucho came to UCLA, and I got to officially meet him. I said, Groucho, I'm very happy to be meeting you after all this time. And he said, well, you should be. (laughs) And uh, Aaron Fleming said, this is Steve Stoliar. 
he's the one who's trying to get animal crackers released. And Groucho said, did you get it? <laughs> and I said, not yet, but we're working on it. And he said, well, you better or I'll fire you. <laughs> I said, I didn't realize I was working for you. How much are you paying me? And he said, a little less than nothing. So, and then I was rewarded with this astonishing job after the movie did come out. Universal humored us by releasing it in, in one theater in Westwood and one in New York. And it was so gratifying, it broke the house record at the UA Westwood that the French Connection had set several years earlier. So we showed them that there was, you know, in this day and age when you have TCM and Blu-rays mm -hmm. and streaming video and all that, you think, well, I don't understand. How could they not have at least put it out? I mean, and then and you have bonus features that have silent movies in them just stuck at the end of DVDs now. But back then, it was a big business decision for Universal, and they just thought, no, we want to focus on important films like Airport 75 and Downhill Racer and things like that. No one cares about the Marx Brothers, even though it was one of their most famous films, the one with Groucho being Captain Spaulding. So, yeah, I was just this super lucky kid that landed this job, and I think even if you're not a big Marx Brothers fan, I've heard from people who say, you know, I really didn't know all that much about them, but just the idea of a kid getting to meet his hero mm -hmm. and spend all that time with him, whether it's a sports figure or a politician or an actress or whatever it is, I think people can relate to, you know, who is your hero? What, what would it be like to work in their house and interact with them in a casual way? And and seeing that hero evolve from, you know, that larger-than-life figure that you see on the screen to a human being who allowed you, Steve, to see him as a human being. I mean, even though and, – and this goes back to the question I asked you earlier. Yes, there are moments as a reader where it was kind of sad to see bits, you know, Groucho slipping away. But yeah. even in those last few years – even uh, one of my favorite parts of the story is even in, in the last hours of his life, he still got off a Grouchoism. So even though yeah. his body was failing him, his mind never failed him. Right. Just, just when I would be thinking, well, I guess he's gotten so frail and hazy that witticisms are past him, he would say something and it would be, really gratifying. I mean, he used to love each day I would get the mail and I would sort through it and then put it on his desk and he'd come to the lunch table and sort of review it. So he came to, he loved getting the, the Hollywood trade papers. So he came to the, the table one day and said, wonderful mail you brought me, nothing but requests for money. And I said, but you got a variety, didn't you? And he said, yes, a variety of requests. <laughs> and, I, and I remember one Christmas, uh, he got a tin of candied almonds from Fred Allen's widow, Portland Allen. And as he walked past my room at the house, he said, S uh, send her one of my Christmas cards. And I said, don't, don't you want to say anything personal or special? And he thought a moment, and he said, well, tell her thanks for the nuts, hope you're the same. <laughs> and then, and even uh, really literally on his deathbed in the hospital, he was sleeping, and the nurse woke him up. Uh, and he said, what do you want? And she said, I want to see if you have a temperature. And he said, don't be silly, everyone has a temperature. <laughs> Uh, meaning 98.6, of course. Yes. Um, so I think even though the, the, the mechanism that made him this brilliant quipper had, had taken some sledgehammer blows from being in his, in his mid-80s and strokes and hardening of the arteries and all that, there was just a reflex there to take a line and twist it and hand it back to you, and he never lost it all the way up to the end. Steve Stolyer is the author of Raised Eyebrows, My Years Inside Groucho's House, an intimate account of the last three years of comedian
Groucho Mark. Steve will be back in a few weeks to share a few more memories of his life inside Groucho's house. Among other things, we will talk about the circumstances that led Steve to becoming Groucho's protector over the last few weeks of Groucho's life, a time during which a tumultuous battle was going on over the control of Groucho's estate. That's coming up in a few weeks on TV Confidential. We'll also talk to Steve about collaborating with noted television director Howard Storm on Howard's memoirs, The Imperfect Storm. All that and more coming up in a few weeks on TV Confidential. In the meantime, Raised Eyebrows, My Years Inside Groucho's House, is available in hardcover, softcover, and as an ebook through Bear Manor Media. It's also available as an audiobook through Bear Manor Media. If you wish to order an autograph edition, you can do so directly from Steve Stolyer himself at Steve Stolyer, S T O L I A R, Steve Stolyer. Com. Greg Airbar will join us for our DVD report next on TV Confidential. Hi, this is Diane Cannon. You're listening to TV Confidential. Hello, I must be going. I cannot stay. I came to say I must be going. Ed Roberts with a reminder that Joan Van Ark will join us in our second hour. We hope you'll stay tuned for that. In the meantime, our guest this hour is Steve Stoyer. Steve Stoyer, screenwriter, author, voice actor, raconteur, and the personal secretary and archivist of comedian Groucho Marx during the last three years of Groucho's life. Steve's book, Raised Eyebrows, My Years Inside Groucho's House, is available in hardcover paperback as an ebook and as an audiobook through our friends at Bear Manor Media. You can also find it at Amazon.com, wherever books are sold online. Steve's website, stolyer.com. Before we went to break, we were talking about the last three months of Groucho's life, a period of time in which Groucho's longtime friend and colleague, Nat Perrin, became Groucho's conservator during a particularly tumultuous battle over control of Groucho's estate. And during that time, Steve Stoyer graduated from being a starry-eyed fan to being Groucho's protector. Nat Perrin asked you to basically be Nat's eyes and ears during those last three yeah, months. Yeah, I mean, I knew, I, I knew that my services weren't needed anymore for for handling fan mail because, you know, he wasn't signing stuff anymore. He was really in precarious, failing health. And I thought, well, they don't need to pay someone to handle fan mail and all that. It's just, and I kept waiting to get a call, you know, from Nat once he was made the interim conservator saying, you know, you're a nice fella, Steve, and uh, you're <laughs> nothing against you, but we're trying to trim expenses here. So, And instead, he said, would you be willing to stay at the house on weekends and look after things? Uh, and I know you have Groucho's best interests at heart. And, and it was like, wow, I, this is, I was flattered, and it was so gratifying to be able to do this service for Groucho, even though he wouldn't have been really aware that that was why I was there then. That was what I was doing in those last months. And that was, and Nat was just a great guy. Nat co-wrote Monkey Business and Duck Soup and created the Adams Family and was just one of Groucho's long-time friends. And he and I were both big Gershwin fans. The difference is he got to Nat got to meet him. He told me that he snuck into Eolian Hall in 1924 mm -hmm. and saw the debut performance of Rhapsody in Blue. He was just a teenager that wanted to see. He was a big fan of Gershwin's. And then when he moved, Groucho brought him out to California to work on Monkey Business. They went to a party, and Gershwin was there, and Nat was so intimidated. And then Groucho drags him over and says, George, I want you to meet Nat Perrin. He's the only person I know that can whistle the entire Rhapsody in Blue. <laughs> and mercifully, Gershwin didn't say, oh, really, I'd like to hear that, because Nat would have had to whistle for 17 yeah. minutes. Yeah. <laughs> you just did a Nat Perrin. You've, you've, you've done bit to Groucho. I mean, you, and you mentioned that you do, when you perform the audio book, you slip in, you, you provide... You know some of the voices, some of the of the of the various characters. Oh, yeah. George Burns. In, George Burns in oh. the audiobook version of Raised Eyebrows. I have to ask you because yes. uh, you you did not necessarily set out to have a career in the entertainment industry. It, it it sort of evolved accidentally, so to speak. In our formal introduction, we mentioned that 
Steve is also an accomplished voice actor who's done a lot, whose voices can be heard in a lot of uh, animated specials. Did you always have that ear for voices in you? Did you pick that up through osmosis just by being in the presence of Groucho and some of the characters in his life? How did that come about, Steve? No, I always had a, a flair for that, even doing impressions of my parents' friends and the rabbi for the temple and uh, teachers. I would imitate them, you know, in class. Kids would giggle. And I just seem to have a flair for that. I think it's nothing to really work at. It's sort of like being able to sing on key. I just happen to be able to replicate a certain number of people's voices. And I'm always kind of pleased when I find that I can, you know, there'll be someone new that I... And it usually comes from me saying something to someone and slipping into that voice in the telling of it and then realizing, hey, I'm kind of sounding like him. Mm -hmm. So I always had that, but yes, the, it was working for Groucho that when I shifted from being a history major at UCLA to being a motion picture television, because I just it was just such a stimulating atmosphere being around those sorts of people, particularly Groucho's friends more than Aaron's strange <laughs> surrogate <laughs> children that she attracted. Yes, and so I ended up. Uh, you know, being a TV writer and uh, voice person, and uh, and there you have it. On the line with us is Steve Stoller. Steve's career as a television writer includes providing material for Dick Cavett, as well as writing episodes of such shows as Murder, She Wrote, Simon and Simon, and the new WKRP in Cincinnati, Steve began his career in the entertainment industry as the personal secretary and archivist of the one, the only, Groucho Marx during the last three years of Groucho's life, a period during which time Steve grew from being a starry-eyed fan to ultimately Groucho's protector during a tumultuous battle over the comedian's estate. All of that and more is chronicled in Steve's book, Raised Eyebrows, My Years Inside Groucho's House, which is available in hardcover, paperback, as an ebook, and as an audiobook through Bear Manor Media. You can also find it Amazon.com, wherever books are sold online. If all goes well, raised eyebrows may become a movie very soon to keep up with that. For more information on Steve, Steve Stolier, S T O L I A R, Steve Stolier. Com. One of my favorite lines in the book is not a Groucho line, it's a Jack Lemon line, which is, there's no reason not to be a nice guy. And it, it resonated with me because I'm a, like you, Steve, I'm a transplant. I moved down, I moved down here about to 10 years ago uh, after growing up and living most of my life in the San Francisco Bay Area. And coming down here, uh, I mean, and before I moved down here, I had been to Los Angeles before to do research on my books and so forth, but Moving before I moved down here, like a lot of people, I had that perception Hollywood is cutthroat, everyone is after each other. And while there is that going on, just as there's that going on in any industry, I have found moving down here and getting to know people and talking to people such as yourself that a lot more people live by the golden rule down here than people realize. And it, yeah. that, that speaks to what Jack Lemon said. Yeah, uh, it was Groucho's, I think it was his 84th birthday party, and I overheard uh, Bill Marks, who was Harpo's oldest son, say to Jack Lemon, you know, there's so many people in this town that are, you know, phonies and selfish and mean-spirited, but I have to tell you, you are genuinely a nice guy. And Lemon said, oh, well, thanks, but, you know, there's no reason not to be. And at the time, I just thought it was just kind of a pleasant comeback. And then, but the more I thought about it, the more I thought it's it's true. There's no reason not to be a nice guy, at least starting off. I mean, my my philosophy is that I'll trust someone until they cross me. Mm -hmm. There's other people who say I don't trust anyone until. I earn their, they, you know, they earn my trust, and you can make a case for both, but I have the, you know, the glass half full thing, where, you know, I don't see a reason to be surly and rude and distant and all that, for starters, and then maybe open up a little. I'll be myself, and then if it doesn't work out, then I can do those other things. 
And it re I really reflect on that a lot about Lemon saying, well, there's no reason not to be. And that that's where that came from. Yeah, and look, go, going back to how we started our conversation and going back to basically how you started your career in the entertainment industry, you, your first step was really res an, an act of kindness. And uh, one thing led to another. You could have just as easily hit the wall and nothing would have happened. But uh, it's, it's just a reminder a lot of times, sometimes a simple act of kindness can open the door to a lot of things. It's true. It sounds corny and saccharine, but it can also be absolutely accurate. Um, Steve Stoyer's book, uh, Raised Eyebrows, My Years Inside Groucho's House, available soft cover, hard cover, ebook, audiobook through Bear Manor Media, also available through Bear Manor Media, is Steve's latest book, which uh, he is the collaborator uh, with Howard Storm and Howard St and in the imperfect storm from Henry Street to Hollywood, the story of Howard's life and career in uh, show business as a comedian, as an actor, and as one of the most uh, prolific directors in television for more than four decades. And I'm just I I had a chance to talk to Howard once about a year ago, but no, oh. uh, but learning learning about Howard's backstory, I can see how you would be a good match because his career goes back to the Borch Belt, uh, you yeah. know, to, to, to the 40s, uh, to the 50s. Yeah, I mean, in, in a sense, it, it's a little unfair to Howard to say that that uh, I brought on him as a collaborator because it would have been hundreds of blank pages <laughs> about Howard. It, I mean, it's his story, but I had a lot to do with the shaping of it and how it was written. And one of the things that I wanted to do it cause for years people in the business have said oh howard's a great storyteller a great rock on tour oh he to have him tell the story about this this and this but i you know as i got to know him i thought i don't want it to just be a compendium of funny anecdotes although you know there are worse things in the world than if it were just that but i was able to draw him out about death and crises of confidence and betrayal and divorce and a lot you know growing up in the depression and the rough neighborhoods and problems with his parents and stuff so in and around all of these charming delightful stories about you know him getting to meet people he admired and becoming uh, part of the stand-up world in the 50s and 60s and then directing the first three seasons of Mork and Mindy and all this other stuff. In and around all of that, there's all of this stuff that I think gives it texture and richness and a more three-dimensional look. I think uh, Richard Lewis, there's a quote of his on the back that says something like, this is one of the most life-affirming reads ever. And I felt really gratified when he came through with that because that was what I was trying to bring to it not just take dictation on funny stories. So it really, and, and Howard just recently said, I can't think of anyone, he said, I, I pat myself on the back asking you to be the one to help me with this because it turned out so well. And, what, you know, what happened was people had been telling him for years, Howard, you have to write your story, you have to put these down on paper and he was directing Dick Cavett in a play about Lillian Hellman and Mary McCarthy and the feud they had years ago and and after each show Howard would regale the cast with his stories and Cavett would say Howard when in the world are you going to write this down so at that time I said I was talking with Howard on the phone once and I said you know when you go you're taking all these stories with you if you don't do that. He's 88 now, mm -hmm. so, you know, it wasn't just, you know, being a, a worry wart. And there was a pause, and he said, I know myself, I know I will never do this by myself. Would you be my partner on this? And I thought, well, now I've done it. <laughs> <laughs> but it worked out well, and so now we have the imperfect storm, and uh, people seem to enjoy this unusual tale of, I mean, he really had so many, I mean, gangsters and mobbed up clubs in the 50s, people threatening his life, and and then, you know, getting to 
getting to do stand-up and getting represented by Jack Rollins, who was handling Woody and Cavett and Nichols and May and uh, playing bigger places and then realizing the cliche of what I really want to do is direct and then going over to Rhoda and and uh, Laverne and Shirley and Taxi and uh, lots of interesting stories about people that was something else I used myself as a litmus test mm -hmm. for who people might find it interesting to hear about he got to know Lucy and Desi in the late 50s because he was part of the Desi Lou Playhouse workshop that they had going and he had a lot of interesting stuff to say about Desi and what he brought and what a problem solver and creative person he was so I drew him out on that sort of thing because there's no end to stories about Lucy, the queen of comedy, Lucille Ball, Lucille Ball, and they just think of Desi as the other guy on I Love Lucy, this Cuban band leader. But Howard's insight on that was, I thought, illuminating. So there's a lot of stories about people. Um, he got to know Zero Mostel while he was, while Zero was blacklisted in the 50s, and uh he, they played a club together, and there's interesting stuff on that. So there's a lot of people you're familiar with, but you haven't heard these stories before. So the that's Im how that came about. The Imperfect Storm by Howard Storm and Steve Stolyer, a life-affirming uh, story, as is Raised Eyebrows, both The Imperfect Storm and Raised Eyebrows, available through Bear Manor media.com if all goes well raised eyebrows will be made into a motion picture steve stoyer thank you so much for joining us i hope you'll join us again as tv confidential it was my pleasure thank you for calling on me we mentioned that steve stoyer wrote for the new wkrp in cincinnati we'll take a look at the original wkrp in cincinnati as part of this week in tv history